so I'm going to show you guys how to uh, use the water maker that we have on our boat at least. Uh, I think they're pretty much all the same for the most part, if you have a manual water maker. There are a lot of automatic water makers in which all you do is press go. Uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of those. Lots more uh, stuff to go wrong. Uh, computers really don't have a place on a boat in my opinion. Uh, I, a computer has no place in a water maker because a water maker is pretty critical like life support equipment. I suppose if you're in a place like the Caribbean where water is pretty much readily available everywhere you go it's not that big a deal but uh, there's definitely places where you could be in some uh, deep trouble if you don't have your water maker and you expect to have your water maker. Uh, so nah, let me show you how it works. So first off our water maker is under the guest bed in the port cabin. So I'm gonna get this lifted up and uh, we'll be right back. This little uh, string here, piece of line, and uh, I used that to hold up the mattress because it didn't have that when we got the boat and it was pretty annoying to, to work on the water maker which is down here uh, with the mattress hanging over you. So you're like shoving yourself in here laying underneath the mattress <laughs> trying to work this stuff. It's not so fun and usually you're pretty hot already so last thing you need is a mattress on top of you. Simple boat hack, right? Step one is to turn the water breaker on. Step two. For us, we have a rinse cycle on ours. So I have to shut this rinse cycle off. Uh, at the end of making water, you have to run fresh water through it. And that rinses all the salt water out of the membranes, which are what's enclosed in those two blue tubes back there. Those are high pressure, you know, rated probably well past a thousand PSI. Although the water maker only runs at about 900 PSI and people have different, uh, you know, points of view on what pressure you should run your water maker at. I looked up the membranes themselves and they're rated to a thousand PSI. So you could actually run them a lot higher than what people typically do. Uh, the thing is you have no room for error. All right. So I'll come back to that. Let's talk about, uh, running the water maker first. So step one is to get your feed pump running. So first thing on our water maker, which is maybe water makers, really cool company story for water makers. Uh, they actually started as a, uh, oh, actually they started as a water making company and then turned into a uh, airline in the Bahamas. So kind of interesting. Or maybe I have that backwards. I can never remember, whatever. All right, so you turn the feed pump on and then press this switch down and it does nothing. Great. <laughs> Why is that doing nothing? Oh, yeah, because instead of doing what I'm supposed to be doing, paying attention, I'm trying water? to educate you guys. Yeah, I was making hot water instead of running a water maker, so. Sweet. She's happy with that. I get dinner out and a hot shower. Uh, so yeah, step one. Make sure you turn on the right breaker for your water maker. And then have a sip of rum and coke. Mm. All right, let's try this again. Okay. So, feed pump turned on. And then you're gonna start. Yeah, I heard it. Okay, so this pressure gauge right here is giving me the pressure of what, what some people call like the priming pump, the feed pump. Uh, I've heard it called a, a number of different things, a little pressure pump. Uh, all this is doing is feeding raw salt water out from the bottom of the boat and pushing it up through this filter on this side, uh, which is just a, I think a 10 micron is what they are typically. And uh, this just removes like the larger particulate matter and, uh, and then runs through here, down through this hose and into the high pressure pump, which is down here. The, uh, the feed pump is actually back this way. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute here. But uh, anyway, you, you wanna get this pump running for a little while and you wanna see at least 35 PSI with my system. Uh, that may vary with different systems, but uh, yeah, you, you wanna see about 35 PSI. That will start to go down as your filter gets dirtier and dirtier. I tend to change it out before it gets below 30, but technically speaking, I think you could go down to like 20 or even 15, but uh, it reduces the efficiency of the system and you just end up wasting power. And these filters are pretty damn cheap. Uh, I use 
paper filters. Uh, they're not recommended. They say don't use these things because they don't last, they don't work well. I don't know, screw that. I'm not spending a lot of money. I like simple, I like cheap. So I just use more of them. As you see, I've got a, uh, a very <laughs> good supply of replacement filters. I suppose that'll probably last me the life of, the life of my time on this boat anyway, if I had to guess. Maybe not though. I don't know, who knows, we'll see. Um, so yeah, you're, you wanna run that, uh, that feed pump for a little while before you get started with running your high pressure pump, which is this guy here. Uh, and this is what actually creates the pressure in the system. Uh, the reason that you wanna run the feed pump for a while is because it gets any air and bubbles out of the system that may have been in there. Bubbles are the enemy of your uh, RO membranes. If you push air through the RO membrane, it will make holes that are a lot bigger than a, a molecule of salt. So you end up with a higher salt content in your water. Uh, it, you know, it comes down to parts per million. That's how you judge how good your water is on a boat. Uh, you wanna see something ideally, I mean, below 300, I would say it's probably good. Uh, if you got a brand new RO membrane system and everything is running tip top, you could get it down to 50 parts per million. Uh, even lower than that, like an RO system in a residential kind of set up uh, where you're working with city water to begin with, which isn't too bad to start, and you're not filtering out a ton of salt, you could get your parts per million uh, down to, geez, like I think our, our home system was down to like five or 10 parts per million. So super, super clean water. Something to keep in mind when you're using an RO system is that you do not get any minerals. Uh, so you do need to supplement that into your diet or add it to your water. All right, so it's been long enough. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start the high pressure pump now. This thing's gonna come on and it'll be pretty loud. So from that point forward, I'll try to be a little louder. Hopefully the audio will come through. Okay, so now high pressure pump is working. This is actually the uh, identical kind of uh, pressure head that you'll find on like a pressure washer. It's a standard pressure washer pressure head. Uh, this is only rated up to, actually, I don't know what this is rated up to, to be quite honest. I'd be interested to look it up and see. Uh, but yeah, I could technically run this hose here, which outputs the high pressure water. I could run that to a pressure washer lines, with like a long hose coming out of here, go out the cabin hatch here, and I could have a pressure washer running right off of this thing. Uh, I don't because it's wear and tear on a critical system, in my opinion. So I, I choose not to do that. I actually have a little portable electric pressure washer I use. Uh, for cleaning the deck and stuff. Uh, so now that uh, the high pressure system is on, I'm going to start turning this valve here, which is basically... It's creating pressure in those two long tubes back there, the uh, RO membranes, and it does it by just sticking a pin through uh, a small hole, which is in line with the hose coming out of the, the water maker system. So all it's doing is it's reducing the, the, the volume of water that is allowed to pass through the system. Uh, and the result of that is increasing the pressure. Uh, so you'll notice that as I turn this knob and the pressure starts to come up, the sound of the pump will get louder because it's working harder and doing what it's supposed to. So you want to turn it up slowly. You don't want to jolt the system and you definitely don't want to shock the membranes. The membranes are the important part of this. As you see here, I'm starting to get some pressure and eventually you'll start to see water. This is the flow meter. This tells me how much water I'm producing with the system. I won't start producing water until I have enough pressure in the system to push fresh water out of the membrane. So there's always going to be some air uh, because there's basically two chambers. Sorry, I'm bringing you up here so you can hear me better. Uh, there's basically two chambers in our RO membrane. There's the inner chamber, which is where the salt water passes through, and then the outer chamber, which is where the, uh, the fresh water, I think that's the way it goes, 
maybe it's in the outer, outer drain, or whatever. You get the point. There's a, an inner part and an outer part of the membrane. And the fresh water comes out one side. What happens when you shut the, the system down is the, uh, the, the fresh water side of the system will drain out. So you inevitably end up with an air pocket in there. So that's, that's the initial air that you're seeing in there. That you don't need to be too concerned about that uh, as long as you ran your feed pump long enough to, to make sure you had at least the, the salt water portion of the RM membrane filled. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this up now. Keep coming. So now I'm right there around 900 PSI and I'm producing water. Uh, I can't. <laughs> Okay, so as I mentioned, there is a uh, an initial pump that kind of feeds the raw water into the system, and it has to be a high flow pump. The idea is that you're producing enough water for the high pressure pump to then compress. I take that back. It doesn't compress the water. You can't compress water. What it does is it creates pressure in a system. So it's it's able to force the water hard enough against what is almost a dead end, which is what that knob does. You're basically creating close to a dead end. If you turn that knob all the way, think of it like this. Uh, when you turn on your uh, a spigot for a hose outside your house, when you first turn it on, you get like a high pressure stream of water that jets out of, of the nozzle. That's because it's under high pressure, because there's a small channel for that water to pass through. Uh, it's an, an interesting analogy when it comes to electricity also. But anyway, so here's the, uh, the feed pump. So that big pump right there is the first pump in the system. Uh, and it pulls through a, a sea strainer or a sea cock that sits right under my feet here. Uh, so there's a hole in the bottom of the boat, comes in, actually, <laughs> even before that, there's a sea strainer. So before you run anything through a pump in a boat, you want it to go through a sea strainer, this way you don't suck a, a barnacle or something like that through there, or I don't know, a fish or anything. <laughs> you could suck anything that's in the ocean through one of these through holes and, and it'll ruin your pump. So you definitely need a, a, a sea strainer. So that one all the way to the left is the sea strainer for our water making system. All right, so a couple of things I want to point out. There is a uh, another filter that sits, another cartridge filter that sits to the right of the particulate filter, that 10 micron filter that I was talking about. And that is a charcoal filter and it is only there for the flushing system. Uh, and you actually don't need it if you're only gonna flush your system with RO water. Uh, the whole purpose of that filter is to remove chlorine and uh, mostly chlorine because chlorine is very bad for an RO membrane. Uh, RO membrane is kind of a living organism in a way. It's very delicate. Um, and if you get city, city water from anywhere, if you pull your boat up to a dock or if you're in a marina and you're filling up with water from the dock, city water, and this, this applies to city water in the U.S. and I'm sure most people are aware of it, there's chlorine in that water and that will degrade your RO membrane if you then flush it with that, that water. Uh, so the charcoal membrane sits in front of the freshwater line that provides the flushing water for the system. Uh, so just in case you do use city water, dock water, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's there as a, uh, a safeguard. Um, we haven't filled up uh, with any kind of city water. Jeez, I don't even... Actually, I think we were in Puerto Rico probably about a year ago. We don't use city water, so I, I, I really don't even need that there. I do keep one in there. Uh, and, and in theory, it should be fine because there is no uh, uh, there's no water passing through there that is going to deactivate that charcoal. Uh, but then again, if I was going to fill up with city water, I would probably replace that if I was going to be flushing the system with it. Yeah, so as it turns out, I uh, accidentally clicked the record button, which stopped the recording uh, when I was about to explain how you have to switch the diverter valve over to actually keep the water. So let's go back in there and I'll show you what that's all about because otherwise you're just gonna be pumping the water out the side of your boat. 
So yeah, that valve right there is, is what determines where the water is going, the fresh water is going. And if it's on reject, that fresh water is just going out the side of the boat. Uh, the reason that's there is because you want to let the system squirt a little bit of fresh water out because that fresh water that starts in the system was sitting in the system since you made water last. Uh, so that is probably going to be stagnant and a little bit briny. Actually, no, it shouldn't be briny, but it's probably fine, quite honestly. Uh, I, I, I don't know. But at the end of the day, uh, yeah, it's, it's good practice because that's what they said. Uh, <laughs> to squirt that out the side of the boat and then turn it over to, uh, to, uh, to keep or whatever it says in there. Yeah, so you want to turn it over to where the water is actually going into your fresh water tank. Uh, that's an important step not to skip. I, I've skipped that before accidentally not paying attention. You know, you got a lot going on, you're entertaining, you're having fun. There's nothing worse than making a whole bunch of fresh water and just dumping it back out into the ocean, so don't skip that one. And I just remember there is one last thing I wanted to talk about, and that is the fact that your pump, your, your high pressure pump, can actually change uh, pressure uh, while you're making water if you're turning loads on and off on your boat high current loads so if you're doing things like making hot water or running uh, <laughs> a clothes dryer <laughs> which yeah that sounds obnoxious but yeah we do actually have a clothes dryer on board and if you've got nothing to do with your power you might as well use it for something uh, if you're running your generator uh, generators like to be run at full load uh, you've probably heard that before if you haven't it's yeah, it, I, I don't know about all that, quite honestly. I'd be interested to hear hear more about it. But I, I know diesel engines don't like running at idle. Uh, I don't know about the necessity of running them at full load versus half load. But anyway, the important part of this is your, your output and pressure can change as you're making water if you're turning high current loads on and off on the boat. So it is important to have that 100 PSI safety margin as as that a safety margin uh for instance if uh i the big one on my boat is i have a dive tank compressor so we we fill our own dive tanks and i can actually uh fill dive tanks at the same time that i'm making water and charging the batteries for that matter and uh it once that dive compressor goes off the pressure on my water maker goes up quite a bit because it's able to uh to pull more pull more power um, you know, it, it probably isn't about pulling more power because I know my wire gauges are large enough going to all these devices, so I don't think it's a, actually an issue of resistance or voltage loss in my system. I actually think it has something to do more with uh, the frequency of these motors uh, because the electric motors that run the compressor and the, my dive compressor and the water maker, they, they produce... A feedback loop in the system basically uh, and you're gonna have to talk to Tesla resurrect him from the dead for him to explain that to you because that's some complex stuff but uh, you, you get like oscillations and weird stuff that goes on in an electrical system when you're running uh, uh, phased motors uh, they're they're really complex in in how they work and quite honestly I don't think anybody can really explain it <laughs> it's one of those interesting things in the world an electric motor uh, it really is a super complex device uh, that we really take for granted. Uh, it's from alien technology, if you ask me. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to shut this thing down. It's pretty simple. Do everything in reverse. Kind of. All right, step number one. Reduce pressure to this one. Rooter valve, probably should have done that first. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, on my system, they recommend that you actually set off the feed pump first because that will reduce the feed pressure. And then there is a sensor right down here that will automatically shut off the high pressure pump. So, feed pump goes off, high pressure pump goes off. Then you flip off the high pressure pump. And then flip on the rinse cycle. The rinse cycle is, uh, it's nice to have. Uh, some water makers don't have it uh, where it automatically will shut itself off. I just flipped that on and uh, there's a timer right here. 
Uh, it runs the uh, the fresh water through this system. It flushes the system uh, for a designated amount of time, and then it'll automatically shut the valve off and stop stop rinsing it. It will also automatically run every seven days, I think, or something like that. I don't know. I never use that feature because I never get there. We always end up making water anyway uh, before seven days is up. Usually before five days is up. Um, yeah, that's pretty much that. So once the water is made, you got to store it somewhere. We've got two separate tanks on this boat. Uh, each one holds just over 100 gallons. I think they're like 103 or 105 gallons. So we hold uh, a decent amount of water. For both the size, it's actually not a lot uh, if, if you're going on mono hull terms. Uh, but catamarans have to keep their weight down. So we don't carry, you know, like the 400 gallons that like a 45 or 50 foot monohull would carry. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna show you what that compartment looks like and uh, show you some of the modifications I've added. These are the water compartments or water containers, whatever you wanna call them. Um, they're plastic, uh, which I kind of prefer. And I added these are uh, float gauges that let me monitor my water level from inside, which I'll show you in a minute here. And I also added this guy right here, which is an overflow. So if I'm filling this tank and it is full, it will basically overflow through this into the other tank. This way I don't have to switch. See each of these lines, this is where the water comes in. So if I don't come up here, there's a tank selector here, and uh, if I don't switch this from starboard to port or back, you know, port to starboard, then uh, in the past, the water would just go overboard. It would come out of one of these tubes here, which is an overflow tube. Uh, and behind that is the output tube. That's uh, the pickup tube. There's a, uh, um, a tube that goes down to the bottom of the tank and that is where uh, the water gets sucked up from, from our pump inside. In fact, I'll show you what it looks like inside. Yeah, so you can see that's what the inside of the tank looks like. And that is the pickup tube. So those are the water gauges I added. Uh, they did not come with the boat, and I think this is a great feature to add if you don't have it on board. Uh, it's pretty annoying to have to walk up to the bow of the boat on open that uh, that hatch just to be able to see if you're running out of water. So those water gauges were uh, an awesome improvement to our system. Uh, pretty simple, kind of expensive actually. You'd be surprised, Those uh, the float gauges, they're like $60 a piece I wanna say and then those gauges are probably, uh, I don't know, 20 bucks or something like that. Maybe more than that, I, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll put a link down below though. Um, it, it's still worth it. Uh, because you tend to pay more attention to how much water you have. There's nothing like running out of water uh, <laughs> When you don't want to run out of water, uh, it could be dangerous legitimately dangerous one last thing I want to take a minute to address is Keeping your water clean It's pretty difficult uh, We don't chlorinate our water or add bleach basically the same thing. We don't do that Which is what cities do to keep their water clean uh, it's really bad for the water maker to be flushed with chlorinated water and it's just really not good for any of the pumps or systems on board. Uh, the, the fittings and, and whatnot. Uh, everything is plastic so it's, it's not like copper lines that most people have in their houses. Although PEX tube is a thing now. Um, anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's tricky to keep your water in, in a good condition. So it's actually a good thing in a way that we don't carry a massive amount of water. Uh, we tend to use our water pretty rapidly. We probably go through like 100 gallons a week on average would be my guess, which is pretty obnoxious by a lot of people's standards, I'm sure. Uh, if, <laughs> if you live on a boat, if you don't live on a boat, that's nothing. Uh, in your house, you probably go through 50 gallons a day. I'd be surprised if you didn't. So yeah, like, like I was saying, keeping your water clean is uh, something to pay attention to. So we will actually go through our tanks and clean them out uh, every six months or so 
just to make sure that things are nice and clean in there. Uh, you can get slime and build up pretty quickly if you're not paying attention, particularly if you leave that hatch open because it likes sun. So we try to keep it dark in there. Uh, that's probably the best thing you can do. And then just make sure you use your water. Like, some people will live off of one tank, uh, which is bad because then you're leaving one tank of old water and it just sits there and gets stagnant. So we try to switch back and forth as regularly as possible. One more thing to think about uh, when it comes to making water or using a desalinator is uh, testing the quality of the water on a regular basis. Some people test it every time they make water. I'm going to admit it. I've gotten a little lax. I don't test it every single time. Uh, if I taste water and it tastes salty, I'll spit it out and I'll test it though, that's for sure. <laughs> which hasn't happened yet, fortunately. You're going to want to get one of these. This is a TDS meter, which is Total Dissolved Solids. Uh, it is useful even in a home environment. It'll tell you how good or bad your tap water is to some degree. Uh, but on a boat, this pretty much just tells you how much salt is in the water. So if you see, there's a decent range of what's acceptable when it comes to the quality of water. We'll see what mine is today, uh, but you know, anywhere below, what is it, 400? Basically below 400 and you're in that average tap water range. Uh, you know, EPA, that's when, the EPA says 500 is no good. Actually, I think it looks like it's more like 480. Uh, so I guess that's when you got to replace your, uh, your membranes if you're over that and then you're in trouble. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's give mine a test and see where we're at. As you saw, I took the water directly from the water maker. There is a bypass valve that allows you to basically just take it straight out of the RO membrane, which eliminates the possibility that there's any contamination that shows up in this test I'm about to do that's coming from the tanks or the pumps or the lines and basically anything in between uh, the, the water maker and my faucet. Uh, so I'll test that afterwards also to see what the quality of the water in my tanks is. Yeah, that's not ideal. It's definitely higher than uh, normal. I'm wondering if uh, I got a bad sample or if I just didn't wait long enough. I just started the water maker and I noticed that as I take samples, it, they tend to be reading higher at the beginning of making water than towards the end. So the quality of the water definitely increases as the water maker runs for longer. So I'm going to come back and we'll try this again and see uh, if, if that rating goes down. So I tried it again. Uh, it's still reading about 340 parts per million, which is, I mean, it's not the end of the world. We're fine drinking this water, uh, but it does tell me that I'm going to probably need to be replacing my RO membranes at some point here in the near future. Uh, I suspect this is because I used to abuse the uh, water maker early on. I couldn't find a video like this, <laughs> so I kind of... Uh, was a little haphazard when I'd start the machine. I wouldn't let it prime uh, for long enough. That first step when you've got the, uh, the, the feed pump running is pretty critical because uh, what happens is air gets pushed through the membranes. And I, I think I did that not too many times, probably just like two or three times. And uh, it, it resulted in my parts per million going up quite a bit. And it seems like the damage is continuing because uh, you're a member, I mean, what I've read is that RO membranes can last for like, uh, like indefinitely. Some people have them for like 10 years. And these are pretty new. I think we've only had them um, a year and a half maybe. I replaced them when we got the boat. So it's been about that. Um, I actually added one. Our water maker used to only have one RO membrane. I added a second one, which doubles its output. We make about 35 gallons an hour. Um, so yeah, that's the reality. And that's why I'm making this video. This way you guys don't make that mistake. Now I'm gonna have a show to my back. Lastly, I wanted to talk. Uh, now I can't remember. <laughs> hey guys, like and subscribe. Leave a comment. It really helps us out. Uh, let us know what you want to see next, or what you don't want to see, or what I did wrong. How to do it right. <laughs> All right. See you next week.